Hello, I'm Greg Aldrich, Research Professor at Kansas State University and Pet Food Program Coordinator. I'm joined today by Ryan Leertz. Ryan is a master's student who's working in our laboratory, and he has a wealth of experience in this process of baking biscuits, especially for the exercise we're going to do today. I'm going to go ahead and put my mask back on to keep Ryan and the rest of us safe. So when we're talking about baked treats we're, or baked foods, we're typically discussing a product that's very dense. Unlike the extruded foods that we would see in the marketplace that have been expanded or puffed, these baked foods are very dense or, or compact. Uh, we still get a lot of crunchiness and texture out of that, and that's coming primarily from the ingredients that we use. And in this case, most of those baked products are baked with the uh, primary ingredient as wheat. And so in treatments number one and three, we're going to be using wheat flour. And in treatment number three, or excuse me, treatment number four and five, we're going to try to mix it up a little bit and use something as a different source that doesn't contain some of that key protein in wheat flour. And that key protein in wheat flour is called gluten. Gluten is made up of special proteins, glutenin and gliadin, and they provide some viscoelastic property to the wheat that gives it memory, uh, viscoelastic properties, and uh, it holds things together in kind of a, an elastic sort of fashion. So Ryan's gonna show you a sample of what we're going to be using today for our wheat flours. We have two different kinds. One is a whole wheat flour, and the second is a second clear flour. One of the things you'll note here is in the second clears flour, it's a little bit ready color and that comes primarily from the, the bran layer of the wheat kernel. So when we're manufacturing baked treats for dogs and cats, mostly for dogs, we're specifically using uh, flour streams that are coming off as a secondary or a third round during the milling process that aren't necessarily going to be used in your home. And so they're a little bit better value, but they also bring to the table a little bit different nutritional composition. Contrast that to our whole red sorghum. You can see that it has a little bit more of a red color. And the thing about red sorghum is it does not contain gluten. And so we have a compromise here in that we're looking at a choice for another ingredient that might be the key matrix as part of that structure formation in our baked treat or, or food product. But it lacks that binding capacity of the gluten. And so we're going to evaluate another ingredient in treatment five in which we've added in a special protein that's going to hopefully give us some of that same structure forming capacity that we lost when we went from wheat to red sorghum by losing that gluten protein. In addition to the wheat flours, we also have an array of other ingredients that are gonna be similar across all of our treatments. The first is cornmeal. We're adding cornmeal to provide some texture, some flavor, and some aroma as we bake that product. In addition to that, we're including salt. And salt is in there not just for flavoring, but it also helps with the functionality of some of the other ingredients as they come together. We're including molasses. Molasses is there for flavor and aroma. It provides a very nice flavor to the baked product as it comes out of the oven, but it also dogs tend to have a little bit of a sweet tooth, so it gives them some flavor that they might enjoy. Um, you can also use other proteins or other sugars as flavoring agents into a baked product. Uh, the molasses also brings with it a little bit of sugars, and those sugars help with the browning reaction that, that occurs during the baking of the treats, so we get a nice rich brown color. Following the molasses, we have a couple of micro ingredients, uh, baking soda to help with a small amount of leavening, non-fat dry milk, uh, which is included to give it some more flavor, and again, uh, it brings lactose sugar, so we get some uh, browning reaction uh, that goes on there for color development. Uh, we're going to add water, uh, every one of those, and we'll add the water towards the end. Sodium bisulfite, that's an acidulant that also helps with dough relaxing, so we don't get things pulled too close together uh, when we're manufacturing those products. Inactive dry yeast, also is not really in this case, it's inactive, so it's not an, a live yeast. So we're not trying to get a leavening or rising out of the dough. It's really there as part of a dough relaxing so we can make the cut and so that after we make the cut that the biscuits don't shrink on us uh, as, they, as they go through the baking process. In treatment one, we're using all-purpose shortening. Uh, that's our fat source. 
and uh, it does provide some change in the texture and you'll see that as we go forward uh, in treatment three we're replacing that uh, all-purpose shortening with a vegetable oil and hopefully you can see the difference by that in uh, this treatment over here with the red sorghum our special ingredient in this case that's going to replace that gluten protein is gelatin it's the same gelatin that you would find in Knox gelatin at the grocery store okay I think that's everything Ryan I think it's time for us to now start to assemble the mix and we start that by taking all of our dry ingredients and including them into the mixing bowl now in an industrial facility we would be adding all of these into a large uh, ribbon type or a sigmoid type mixer uh, during the mixing process we're going to add the water at the end and as we add that water and that dough begins to hydrate it'll uh, be very dense and so you have to have just the right kind of mixer uh, to bring those all together because there's a lot of tension remaining in the dough so I'm going to mix all of my dry ingredients over here in treatment five and then we'll work our way towards the middle so as we're bringing those in we're going to mix all the dry ingredients it just takes a few moments here to bring them all into the mix and instead of using a mechanical mixer or something like a Hobart which is a planetary mixer or even a ribbon based mixer such as what we'd find in a factory we're going to use the old-fashioned style our hands good fun right just a little. now that we've got all the dry ingredients in we'll give it a little bit of a toss to try to combine most of those ingredients it doesn't have to be a thorough mix the next step is we're going to add our shortening our oil and so I'm going to drop that shortening in and what we need to do is cut that shortening in we don't want to actually make a homogenous mix we're just going to kind of chop that until it gets into the mix and it will still be a little bit lumpy but that's okay I don't know if you can see that very well there but we'll make a lumpy little mix here and those fat globules will end up melting as we go into the baking process and get uh, evenly distributed throughout each of the treats what we're trying to do here by cutting that in is to provide texture to the product so we have that dry mix I'm going to go to the next one and mix it so that we can do the water addition and uh, prepare these all at about the same time okay we've been able to incorporate the fat into the mix and we've cut it in now we're going to add our liquids I'm going to make a nice little hole in the middle um, I've taken some of my water and added it to my molasses and given it a shake so we can get most of it out and then we'll pour that in uh, we'll follow up with a little bit more water to get the rest of the molasses out of that mix there we go we'll give it a little swirl here here she comes into solution close enough we'll add the rest of our water and how much water do you add well it really depends on the hydration property of the flour and uh, it's a bit of a trial and error from a formulation standpoint we try not to add any more water than is necessary to develop our dough this would be kind of what a, an undeveloped dough would look like it's going to make a nice little clump in your hands uh, we will incorporate all that until it gets into a, a larger dough ball you can kind of see here what's happening I may have to add just a little bit more water we're starting to see the flour absorb that water and those starch granules start to swell a little bit the other reason we don't want to add any more water than is necessary is because a lot of that water we have to take back out during the baking process the baking process can be the limiting factor in our production and so uh, if we have to remove a great deal more water than is necessary because we added too much water in the process then we can uh, slow down our baking time in the oven and slow down or decrease our throughput through the factory the other thing that's going on here from a water standpoint now it's not such a big deal for what we're doing today in a uh, sheeted and cut biscuit application but when we go into rotary molding if the product is too wet it'll stick in the die and uh, we want it to be able to release from that die cavity onto the cloth belt otherwise we end up uh, slowing down our operation again and that's part of the art that's associated with this whole process 
is getting it to where it's got just the right amount of moisture so that it will form that dough and it will release from the rotary when we're in the process of forming those pieces. All right now, so we've got everything mixed in and you can see here is the wheat controlled one and we've got a nice uh, firm ball of dough. It's not risen, but it is uh, different than what we would use in a rotary, which would be a coarse or a less developed. We've added a little bit more water here since we're making a sheeted product. And so it forms a nice resilient kind of dough. You can see the viscoelastic properties here. So as I pull that apart, it resists being pulled apart. And as I take my hands away, it relaxes back. And that's that property that gluten's bringing to the equation. So what I'm going to do next is to sheet this or roll it out. You guys are probably used to this from your own home experience. First off, we're going to put some flour down on our cutting surface. I'll set that aside. I'm going to take about half of this dough to sheet out. That's all we need for this exercise. I'm going to use some guardrails here to make sure that we've got the same depth when we're at the point of uh, cutting. I'm going to try to get that out in a nice, even sort of dough here. So we'll set that down and we'll begin to roll. The idea here is to not to fold that dough too many times or we'll end up with lots of cracks and fissures. We call that in the industry cracks and checks and cracks and checks end up being a weak spot in the dough. And uh, the weak spot continues to grow and increase in size and dimension as we bake and uh, makes a weak biscuit. When we get a weak biscuit during the manufacturing process, because most of those processes are automated, uh, we end up with breakage and breakage means loss. We either have to remanufacture those biscuits or we have to toss them away because nobody wants to buy a box of biscuits in which everything is broken. So we've just about got it down to where it's a uniform sort of depth. And then we'll start the cutting process. Ryan, can I get you to get me a cookie sheet, please? All right, we're gonna do two different sizes of biscuits here. And we'll start with a uh, small and a large, okay? So I'm gonna make a couple of small biscuits. We'll peel those out. Make about four of those real quick. That one didn't cut so good. Oh, looks like we got a little uh, mechanical problem here. We'll make some large ones. Place those on the parchment paper in our pan. And then, fork please. We're going to insert some docker holes or docker pins. That's usually inserted in the die in a rotary uh, for those that we cut, uh, sheet and cut in this example. Uh, we're going to do that with a fork. What we're trying to do is really create little chimneys. And uh, we have moisture inside of the biscuit. And what we're gonna try to do is give it an outlet so that that moisture as steam or vapor can escape uh, the, the interior so that we don't have a high level of moisture inside the biscuit and none on the outside of the biscuit. All right, so that's that project. Ryan, would you hand me Treatment number four. Thank you. Number four. Okay. Now remember what you saw previously with the gluten. We've added about the same amount of water. In fact, we had to add just a little bit more water into this red sorghum product. There is no elasticity. It just crumbles in my hand. So it's going to be a challenge for us to form that biscuit. So we'll give it the old college try. Let's see, I only needed half of that. We'll set that aside. 
Let's give it a little bit more work so that we can see if we can get it to stick together. So a lot of times our friends in marketing may tell us that we want to have a biscuit that's made from something other than wheat because wheat out in the pet food world tends to have a negative connotation, possible allergen, possible uh, issues with uh, the rate at which that uh, starch is utilized by the animal. Uh, so it has a higher glycemic index. That may be a negative. But the challenge is, as you can start to see here, the reason we use wheat so much is not because we don't want to use something else, uh, though some people will. It's really from a functional standpoint. You can see here really quickly that the sorghum doesn't want to play. It doesn't want to play. See how that's coming apart there? Don't do that one until I'm ready. I want to show the, the see if that gelatin uh, has helped us at all. Okay, so I need another uh, cookie sheet, if you would, please, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, so let's cut out a couple of, uh, of the red sorghum. I got to be very tender with those. You can see already that there's going to be some cracks. It's just not coming together. We'll try another one here. I'm going to do several of these and see if we can get them out. Nope, that one's not going to come out. See if we can get them to come out as a whole piece. Eh, not going so well, is it? There's one. Nope, it crumbled on me. Okay, let's come back here. And we'll try to grab another one somehow. How's that one looking? Uh, it's still kind of crumbly. Yeah. Might need more water, might just not be uh, might, might not work. Well, if it doesn't work, that's all right. That's what we're here to try. All right. Let's see if we can gently get a couple more out of there. We'll try to get him out of there. Come out whole, come out whole, come out whole. You're doing good. Okay. There you go, we'll do one more here. One more little one. Let's see if we can get him out real gentle-like. There we go. It worked, yay. Okay, now we'll go to the big ones. We'll see if we can get a couple of big ones out intact. And you see, notice how much tender loving care we have to give to it to get it to come out. It's just not forming structure, is it? There we go. That one looked pretty good. Uh, Dr. Aldridge. Yes, Ryan. Does it take a certain amount of water to activate that gelatin? Um, well, gelatin is very thirsty, so it may take a lot more water, and it actually will absorb the water faster than the starch out of the out of the uh, sorghum. So we have four large and four small there. We'll go ahead and gently put in some Docker pin holes. This treatment pipe is, act is reacting a little better with added water. Added water, good. That's a good observation, Ryan. So in a research project, we document that, right? Now, one of the challenges is it needs more water for it to do its job, but alongside that, then I've got to figure out how to get it baked and remove that water mm -hmm. during the process, right? So there we go. We have a few biscuits out of that product. We'll scoop this up. All right, so Ryan's added some more water to try to activate that gelatin. And we're starting to get a little bit better dough formation there because of it. We'll sweep this off the table. There we go. All right, Ryan. How do you think? You I, ready? I think that this will be adequate to make some biscuits. Okay. And at least roll some of it out. Drop that on me. All right, let's see if we can get a nice uniform dough. And uh, we'll put those out like that. All right, yeah, that's, that's behaving a little better, but it's still not happy with the process putting pressure on it and rolling it out. So you can see quickly what that gluten does for us. It gives us a lot of elasticity. It gives us some viscosity. It gives us some binding properties. It's sort of a magic protein. And 
I know that a lot of people think it has a bad name out there. I get it, especially if you're uh, gluten sensitive or allergic to gluten. And this has been a very vibrant area of research at the university level for years is trying to come up with some of these same properties or at least food products that don't contain gluten but you can quickly observe how much added value it brings to the equation from a food functionality standpoint. So the gelatin has helped us a little bit in our previous research. That kind of is what we observed as well. And uh, we've used a number of other uh, soluble animal proteins like egg white and uh, plasma and shown some of the same sorts of results we're getting here with the gelatin, in some cases even better results. So, okay, this is all right. So we've got several there of the small. I'll make a couple of large. Let's see if we can pry those out of there without losing their structure. Oh, much better, much better. They're still very tender um, and they want to break apart, but we're starting to make some progress. All right. Make two more, and then we're on the path. This is actually feeling like it's getting a little bit more toughness as it sits. And that's the other equation here is sometimes as things sit a little bit longer, it gives that starch a little bit more time to absorb the moisture and become a little bit more sticky. All righty, that brings us to the next step of the equation and that is taking those biscuits into the oven so that we can bake them. And we'll join you here at a moment to insert them in the oven and talk a little bit more about the baking process.